So first, I'd like to thank Anselm, Frankie, for inviting me. I'd like to thank the whole AKW team for this extremely nice invitation. And I'd like to thank uh, Avery, who's not my former colleague, but my former neighbor. <laughs> so thank you all. Speaking of Anselm, Frankie, when he invited me to speak and asked me if I had something to contribute to something called the next war. So I looked in, you know, whatever I had that was really gloomy in store. And I came up with that work that I was, I mean, that series of uh, texts that I was working on, which are about how the European Union tries to constitute itself as a gated community for aging, white, affluent people, and how in that process its representatives seek to dispose of those people who risk lowering the capital value per capita of the population dwelling on the European soil. So I thought that was depressing enough. But Anselm said, OK, it's fine, but can you make it a little more gloomy, a little more warlike, and especially, can you maybe focus a little bit on Germany in the gloom and the warlikeness? So, you know, that, I'm going to try to do what I can. Um, and thanks to the Greek crisis, I thought I could add some gloom and some German bashing to the mix. But then the refugee crisis came along and Angela Merkel's statement on August 30th about welcoming refugees, and so it all became a little more complex once again. So here is the difficulty that I'm faced with. So I will start going back to my initial topic, the gated community story, um, how and why the implementation of a neoliberal agenda turn Europe into this gated community, primary mindful of its credit, and thus determined to dispose of those who are deemed uncreditworthy. And then I will try to add, if I have time, a little bit on the Greek crisis and on the refugee crisis to sort of bring it to the present, if I can. So, two parts. The first part, I will try to explain what I mean by the neoliberal agenda, showing that it is not exactly what the founding fathers of neoliberalism said it would be. And then I will try to assess what the implementation of this neoliberal agenda entails in Europe for those who are plagued by a low credit. So first, the neoliberal project. For the founding fathers of neoliberalism, meaning Friedrich Hayek, the Ordo Liberal Group in Germany, Röpke, Oecken, Müller-Armack, and also, of course, the Chicago School, Milton Friedman and his cohorts, there was an anxiety in the project and the anxiety was about the fact that democracy, liberal democracies, Western liberal democracies, the free world, was slowly descending into socialism. Not because of an impending revolution, not with the bang of a revolution, but with the whimper of Keynesian counter-cyclical policies. One compromise at a time the West was entering into socialism. And this was prompted by the way democracy works. Democracy elects people who are voted in by the majority. And if the majority are wage earners, and if these wage earners identify as a working class, well, they will vote for those who seek to represent them, and that will mean that liberal democracy will cease to be liberal, will cease to be this free society that the neoliberal wanted, and instead will become socialist. So how to prevent that, and at the same time, remain within the confines of liberal democracy? 
In other words, how can you make sure that political liberalism will stay in line with economic liberalism? So that's what they worked on. And they worked on it for 30 years. And the good thing was that they were sidelined for the most part. And at the time, the Keynesian mode was the prevalent mode uh, in the West, even in the US. And so therefore, these people were considered basically right-wing kooks. And so they had time to just think, since they were not exercising any power. And so they developed a method. They developed measures to make sure that democracy would remain liberal and would not fall into socialism. And the program had three parts. The first part was about firms, was about corporations, was about companies. An important thing was to find the measures that would make sure that firms would fulfill what Milton Friedman calls their sole social responsibility, namely maximize profit for the shareholders. And that they would do that instead of giving priority to their own standing with their stakeholders, be it their employees, suppliers, government agencies, or customers. So that was the first part, to keep corporate managers and company focus on profit for the shareholders. In order to do that, and that's the second stage, you need governments to be geared towards tending to the proper functioning of markets and to the integrity of the price mechanism, instead of interfering with them. And so they developed these ideas, such as the golden rule that would prevent any form of excessive budgetary deficit, so that the governments wouldn't have much leeway with respect to its fiscal policy. And also the idea of an independent central bank that would be only focused on price stability so that the government couldn't tinker with money. So these were ways of making sure that elected governments would nonetheless remain liberal, stick to classical liberalism. And then the third part, which was probably the most important part, or the, the kernel of the program, was about having wage earners learn to think and behave like their employers, Instead of, in of, instead of identifying as a class whose interests clash with those of the business community. So, in order to, since the risk is that wage earners will identify as a working class and vote then for the representative of the working class, if you make sure that people who are not entrepreneurs by trade nonetheless think and behave like entrepreneurs, well, then they will vote for the representative of the entrepreneurs, and we're good. We have a classical liberal democracy. So in order to do that, they believed in the wisdom of private insurances regarding health care and pensions, of increased home ownership, because when people own their homes, they start to care about the value of their property and about the real estate market altogether. And also, as much as possible, to substitute private loans for social benefits. Because when you deal with private loans, you start thinking behaving like a taxpayer instead of like a user of public service and goods. So that was the plan, and th this plan was, of course, developed in a whole series of very complete, complete set of policies. And after being sidelined for 30 years, when they finally got to power, or at least when they finally got to advise those who were in power, that's what happened at the turn of the 80s with uh, Reagan and Thatcher's uh, conservative revolution, then they had their program fully implemented. So, you would think that this is it. What we have, since we've had that program being implemented for now more than 30 years, that we would have the kind of world that they promised. However, despite 
the enduring success of their views. The world, the world that has been shaped by their policies is not exactly the one that they promised. What they had promised was a world where private companies, public administrations, and peoples of all ways of life, whether salaried, self-employed, or even unemployed, all people would think and act like profit-seeking entrepreneurs, like agents whose main concern was to maximize their income and minimize their costs. That would mean for companies maximizing their profit, for people maximizing their income, for states trying to maximize the general growth of the territory under their jurisdictions. However, what their policies produced instead was not a world where private companies, public administrations, and peoples of all ways of life are encouraged to think and act like profit-seeking entrepreneurs, but rather they are encouraged to act like credit-seeking asset managers, like agents whose main concern is not to maximize their income and minimize their cost, but whose main concern is to maximize the capital value of their assets in the eyes of investors. And that's a very different kind of people, very different kind of economic agent. So how did it happen? How did that shift happen? Well, very roughly, I think we can summarize it, summarize it as such. In the name of focusing corporate managers on their shareholder satisfaction, neoliberal governments deregulated financial markets. So we had financial, market, financial capital swelling thanks to the deregulation of financial engineering, so all kinds of derivatives products. And we had financial capital moving freely not only from one country to another, but also from one kind of financial institution to another. So that meant that investors could choose where they would put their money, where they would put their fund, where they would invest. And they would choose according to how the managers of the projects that were looking for money would perform for them. Thus, competition which is, after all, the ultimate liberal watchword, competition was no longer what it was for classical liberalism, Adam Smith and his followers, namely having producers competing for consumers, having firms competing for clients. But competition was now about managers competing for investors. And that change had momentous consequences. First, corporate managers learned that their primary job was no longer to optimize the commercial profit of their firm over time, that is to say, to maximize the difference between the accumulated income generated by the sales of commodity and the aggregate cost incurred to produce them, so the classical way of making profit, but that their job was about increasing the credit, not the profit, of the corporation's stock in the eyes of impatient investors. That is to say, to maximize the difference between the projected result of the company, so what you project your company is going to do, and the doubts that financial markets and financial analysts might harbor about your ability to deliver them. So the point is not so much to maximize your profit, that is to say to maximize the difference between the sales of the commodities you produced and the cost, but it is about producing an image of future results minus the hesitation, the doubts, that financial markets and analysts will have about your ability to deliver these results. So in short, the job of the corporate manager 
was to boost what is called the shareholder value of the company in the short term, so the value for the shareholder, and not to ensure its commercial success in the long run. That was the first switch. So for companies, credit superseded profit. Second consequence, governments, once they were faced with that new situation, learned that their own calling was no longer to optimize growth and facilitate full employment, but to make the territory under their jurisdiction attractive to investors. Since, after all, that's what the key to success, attracting investors. This meant that governments needed to give investors what investors find attractive. And what do investors find attractive? Investors are simple people. They have very specific tastes. They don't change very much. And these tastes are a flexible labor market, a business-friendly tax code, especially with respect to capital gain, and strong intellectual property rights to make sure that no potentially money-making idea would remain unpatented. So you have to make sure that you fulfill this expectation if you're a government. Of course, the problem with an agenda predicated on attracting investors is that it translates into precarious labor conditions for most of the people, for most wage earners anyway. It translates into drastic budgetary costs affecting social programs and public services. And it translates in the privatization of either two common resources. Thus, the governments, even though they wanted to stick to the program, were nonetheless worried that their priorities could cost them their re-election. Because, after all, the majority of people might not be so happy with the consequences of being attracted to investors. So public officials sought to make up, tried to make up, for the loss of tax revenues, for instance, that their policies uh, would result in by borrowing the money that they needed. In other words, instead of using tax revenues in order to fulfill your, tax, your tasks as a government, you're going to borrow money. And where are you going to borrow money? Well, you're going to borrow it from the same investors that you try to attract. And of course, these investors, what they do is lend money, so they're very happy to oblige. But of course, they do it on their terms. They do it on their condition. And the condition that they give to lend more money is that the governments will continue their welfare reform, that they will continue their labor, labor cost reduction, that they will continue their tax, their tax cuts and rebates. So, since, because, capitalism are free-flowing, uh, governments have no other choice than compliance, these governments will become as, de as dependent on financial markets as corporate managers are dependent on financial markets. In other words, just as corporate managers sought to boost the shareholder value of their company, what public what public officials will do is to try to boost what uh, the German sociologist Wolfgang Streich is called the bondholder value of their national debt. That will be the main compass of their policy. The main compass of their policy will no longer be maximizing growth, but it will be to make sure that the people who hold their treasury bills, who hold their bonds, are happy. Right? So, there again, what they're looking for is to maximize not their national revenue or GDP, but to maximize their credit in the eyes of bondholders. So the same kind of shift. Third consequence, the twin pursuit of shareholder value and bondholder value, respectively by corporate and public managers, will eventually permeate the behavior of private citizens as well. Because with ever, ever more precarious jobs and shrinking social benefits, 
large sections of the population will find it increasingly hazardous to stake their material welfare on stable jobs, regularly increasing wages, and a publicly funded safety net. Thus, in order, once again, to dissuade their constituents from rebelling against neoliberal reforms, what governments have done is that they have endeavored to do for their constituents what they had done for themselves, namely, substitute borrowed for earned money. In other words, the next wave of reforms involve making private credit more available. What people could no longer purchase with their salary, they could still buy, albeit on credit. And the result was that people's livelihood started to depend less on their labor income than on the value of two types of assets. The durable goods they bought on credit, which operate as collaterals. That's what we've seen with the real estate bubble, right? People can borrow money to buy a house, and the collateral is the house itself. And what makes you able to re-borrow again and take another loan is, once again, the fact that the value of the house that you're trying to buy with that loan goes up. But also, the other asset that becomes essential is their own trustworthiness as a borrower, something that in many countries is measured by something called a credit score. So if you're known to be someone who reimburses his or her loan, then you will get the loan. So your reputation becomes a fundamental asset. Moreover, the transformation of the labor market multiplies the number of private contractors. That is to say, people with no long-term jobs, with no pension or health care benefits. Some of these people are selling their precious skills, people selling their ability to design computer programs, but also people selling their ability to build up IKEA furniture for clumsy households. But others will, sell, will have nothing else to sell than their willingness to be overexploited. Many jobs, zero-hour jobs in Britain, and so forth. The fact that you're ready to work for a very low salary with no benefits and no guarantee of any sort makes you valuable. It's an asset. And still others are going to survive on renting their capital goods, a room in their flat on Airbnb, a drive in their car with Uber, and so forth. In all these cases, people appear less as wage earners seeking to sell their labor power than as projects looking for investors and staking their livelihood on their credit worthiness, sought-after talents, availability to work long hours without benefits, charming room in your flat, and so forth. In short, credit, capital value in the eyes of potential and actual investors will be key for individuals as well as for companies and countries. So going back to the perspective of liberal governments, or rather of neoliberal governments, one can see that for them, being attractive to investors, and thus boosting the bondholder value of their public debt, involves, on the one hand, helping companies on their soil maximize their shareholder value, but also, and just as importantly, or even more importantly, maximizing the capital value per capita of the population under their jurisdiction. In other words, their role as a government is to tend to the creditworthiness of the population under their care. My water credit is disappearing quickly. What this second dimension of their art of governing entails includes two things, two opposite things. It includes enticing people in, to invest in the goods in the services and in the conduct that are likely to increase their overall capital value, 
or at least to ward off the depreciation of the material assets they possess and of the immaterial assets they project. But it also involves managing those people whose credit is low and whose project for enhancing it is questionable. In other words, managing the discredited or the people who are on the verge of lacking credit altogether. So that's the general neoliberal project as I see it. Now, it's on the management of the ostensibly discredited that I want to dwell now in the context of the European Union. Indeed, ooh, did I do that? Both the European Union itself and the nation states comprising it are similar to the other parts of the developed world that have adopted a mode of government predicated on the quest for credit, the quest of credit. Thus, like any territory subjected to the tastes of choosy and mobile investors, Europe is ruled by governing agencies who address the population they govern as a collection of asset-bearing individuals and who consider that raising the ratio of capital value per capita should be their chief objective. Now, to reach such a goal, two paths can be followed, either alternatively or in combination. The first one involves equipping current nationals and residents with appreciable skills, as well as bringing in either skilled or, or especially flexible foreigners. The second dimension, the second possibility, concentrates on relieving the land from those who are regarded uncreditworthy. In other words, disposing of the discredited. Or, to quote Achille Membe's Critique de la Raison Nègre, to dispose of those who are deemed unexploitable, not even exploitable. So, first, the reaccreditation part, right? The equipping people. In the mid 1990s, the investment in human capital path became the central piece of what could be called neoliberalism with a human face. The third way governments, in particular, the governments of Schroeder in Germany, of Blair in England, and of Clinton in the US, developed a rhetoric which was steeped in what could be called recovery psychology, which was a rhetoric about helping people help themselves, which was the motto of Clinton's uh, welfare reform. Giving back the will to win to the workless class, which was the motto of Blair in his early years. The role of a government, these third way um, leaders claimed, was to cure its self-depreciating constituents from their addiction to the social benefits and full employment policies of the past by giving them the tools and the desire to make themselves appreciable, but also to welcome those foreigners who either brought appreciated competences with them to the country hosting them, or showed their appreciation to the hosting country through hard work for little pay and protection. Now, in the 2000s, this investment in human capital policy was uh, illustrated utmostly by the reports of the OECD, which expounded the merits of large investment in education in order to give the people the skill to sort of boost their credit, empathetic workfare, so as to you know, encourage people who are unemployed to find the energy to get back to work, and also relatively open borders. I'm, I'm talking about the OECD here. Relatively open borders in order to let in people who were re ready to work hard and, or who had the proper skills. And these OECD reports have become the template of neoliberalism with a human face. Along with policy recommendations, these reports also like to cite the countries that they see as the poster children of their approach. 
Finland with respect to education, Denmark's flex security with respect to welfare reform, Canada with respect to immigration. Though it was hardly advertised as such, the second path to enhance attractiveness, meaning to trying to make your country as creditworthy as possible per capita, so the second path to enhance uh, attractiveness, namely the disposing of the discredited approach, was never entirely foregone, even in the glorious day of the third way governments. For instance, while celebrating the immigration of the talented and the flexible, Tony Blair never failed to contrast them with the allegedly fake asylum seekers whose only motive was to take advantage of Britain's generosity. This is a remarkable comparison with the present. Under Blair, the good migrants were the economic migrants. The bad migrants were the asylum seekers who were just cheating, pretending to be asylum seekers to get social benefits. These days, as we will see at the end of this talk, if I get there, the good and bad has been sort of switched around. So, for the bright British Prime Minister at the time, for, for Tony Blair, getting rid of burdensome migrants, or at least denying them entry, was at least as important as attracting the migrants of choice. So there was already a disposing of the discredited path, although relatively concealed or discreet. Yet in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, the techniques of government purporting to dispose of the discredited have ceased to represent just the dark underside of population management. Instead, they have become the predominant way of sustaining the ratio of valuable assets per capita, most notably, notably within the confines of the European Union. So why, I mean, of course we've seen it in all developed countries, but why did the European Union embrace the pruning approach, so to speak, to the pursuit of credit more vigorously and more systematically than the other parts of the developed world? That, I think, can be attributed to two major factors. Firstly, while both the European Union and the US responded to the crisis by refurbish refurbishing the financial system without reforming it, substantially at least, at least the Obama administration complemented the rescue of Wall Street with a modicum of fiscal stimulus. In Europe, however, here comes my German bashing, which I was commissioned to do. In Europe, however, the German authorities used their dominant position in Europe to persuade their partners that lax fiscal policies were not the way to go. At the same time, the European Central Bank, very much a German institution, remained faithful to what is supposed to be its sole calling, namely ensuring price stability regardless of the circumstances, even at the cost of inducing deflation. Consequently, once the losses incurred by financial institutions were duly socialized, thereby causing the national debts of the more fragile member states of the EU to soar dramatically, the ensuing austerity measures proved especially drastic at least on Ireland and on Southern Europe, since they were neither preceded nor accompanied by counter-cyclical counter measures, so fiscal stimulus. So as countries like Greece, Spain, Italy, Ireland faced financial collapse, the ECB was forced to circumvent its own bylaws, which forbid it to finance state directly and thus create quantitative easing, where they would sort of help the countries that would continue austerity by promising that if you continue austerity, I will buy your bonds, I will buy your treasury bills, so that the interest rates on your debt will not go up. However, this condition was a way of sponsoring the pursuit of austerity, which of course didn't make things better for the people inside these countries. <coughs> 
Now, thank you. It is worth stressing that official proclamation notwithstanding, debt reduction was hardly the purpose of the austerity program. The real raison d'etre of these programs was to assure that creditors, to assure creditors, I'm sorry, that their loans would be serviced ahead of any other consideration. In short, the credit worthiness of a country was ultimately incumbent on its willingness to sustain the credit of those who hold its bond, with the consequence of multiplying the number of the discredited among its own population. So that's the first reason. The first reason is that while in the US there was a modicum of stimulus, in Europe, austerity set in as early as 2009. Second reason why Europe is special in its disposing of the discredited elan is the fact that in the fall of 2008, the anxiety generated by the looming Great Recession caused European leaders to promise their constituents that they would be protected from the wreckage that irresponsible speculators had wrought. However, as these same leaders used the political credit that their promises had given them to restore the hegemony of the financial, mar of the financial institutions, the protection that they could still offer once they had refurbished the financial system would no longer take the form of a new New Deal. They didn't have that money anymore because now they were major public debts. So since they were unable to shield their population from the exigencies of investors, what they offered instead, European governments, was to protect them not against bankers, not against uh, eviction due to the real estate crisis, but to protect them against the impending flood of non-European migrants, primarily, though not exclusively, from Africa, as well as from the creeping identity trouble created, supposedly, by the presence of culturally alien minorities on their soils, meaning Muslims. The menace of a huge inflow of migrants was, of course, totally imaginary at first, if only because emigration from developing countries tend to be closely linked to the state of the labor supply in developed countries, which means that a high rate of unemployment is usually much more dissuasive to immigration than tightened border control. Yet, with the violent aftermath of the Arab Springs, the fear of the flood of migrants was given a modicum of credibility by virtue of swelling the numbers of asylum seekers desperately trying to cross the Mediterranean. Thus, for European authorities, curbing immigration and blaming the budgetary deficits on the cost of resident foreigners became a privileged way of showing care and protectiveness to a population subjected to the pain and worries caused by their own austerity plans. So, altogether, a persistent preference for deflationary measures and the increasing appeal of fanning xenophobic sentiments explain why Europe has chosen to maintain its credit by purging its territory of ostensibly uncreditworthy people, or at least by keeping them from affecting its reputation in the eyes of investors. Whether deployed at the level of the European community as a whole, or assumed by member states, or fine-tuned sometimes by private-public partnerships, the techniques of governments involved in such an endeavor, disposing of discredited, as in fact can be divided in four categories. There are sort of four major techniques, until recently, in order to get rid in order to dispose of the discredited, in order to make sure that the discredited don't tarnish the image of the country in the eyes of investors. The first way of reducing the negative impact that a, dis that a discredited population produces on the attractiveness of a territory is to remove it from the statistics revealing its sorry state. In the, U in the European Union, as in many other places, the unemployed are, of course, the main targets 
of such obfuscations. And practically, there are three major techniques to reduce the official numbers of unemployed people. I say the official number of unemployed people. Firstly, employment seekers can be given another status and thus be removed from the statistics. For instance, in Sweden, the Netherlands, and Britain, long-term unemployment was customarily, until recently, converted into invalidity. So that allowed to uh, remove these people from the unemployment statistics. Whereas in France, early retirement was the substitution of choice. That happened until the government of these countries realized that the pensions they needed to pay to those they declared invalid or retired clashed with the budgetary costs that, that they were expected to make. Second technique, insofar as the International Labor Office defines unemployment as the condition of a person who does not have a job but is actively looking for one, the civil servants in charge of receiving and guiding job seekers have been tasked with showing that the people who come to their office are often insufficiently motivated in their search to keep the right of calling them unemployed. So they're again removed from the statistics. And thirdly, when employment seekers cannot be forcibly removed from the unemployment registers, the, more, the most expedient way to proceed is to persuade them to remove themselves. In other words, inducing discouragement, or better still, self-depreciation, is another mission, perhaps the most important one, that the employment office's experts are supposed to fulfill. To that end, officers in charge of managing the unemployed are incited to send people under their care to job interviews that they have no chance of passing successfully, thereby imparting to them that they are unfit for the job market. So that's the first way of disposing of the discredited, at least the official list of discredited. But the unemployed are not the only dis group of discredited people whose self-depreciation is deliberately pursued. To induce suicidal depression through systematic harassment also figures among the well-honed techniques that the students of what is called new public management have applied to the beneficiaries of social programs subjected to severe cuts and to the practitioners of good corporate go governments and, and, uh, and the measures that practitioners of good corporate governance have tested on the employees they want to get rid of. Of course, the art of bringing supposedly abusive welfare recipients and allegedly superfluous staff to suicidal depression is hardly unknown outside of Europe. However, it is important to recall that prior to the neoliberal era, European citizens were especially prone to identify with the social benefits that they receive and to identify these social benefits with vested rights and to assume that laid-off workers should be compensated. Thus, I would argue that their lasting attachment to the welfare state of yore is what makes harassment especially appealing to European governments and corporations. Because European governments find it politically more risky to suppress a social program than to impart on its recipients that they don't deserve the benefits to which they claim. And the corporate managers find it more expedient to make their employees feel unworthy of their job than either pay the required firing compensation or wait for drastic reforms of the labor laws. So that's harassment is then the second method of choice. The third method that has been recently developed since 2008-2009 is remarkably at odds with the virtuous recommendations emanating from the OECD, remember, regarding the necessity of investing in human capital. This third major technique, purported to boost the credit of a country, consists in fostering the emigration of its educated youth. Whereas in Greece and in Spain, the drought of job opportunities has persuaded many people to try their luck elsewhere, for both the Irish and the Portuguese governments, 
encouraging their own population to leave is a deliberate and openly admitted policy. In Ireland, a population of 4.6 million people, more than 500,000 nationals have left since 2008, which represent an increase of 289% compared to the previous years. 87% of these half million emigrants were less than 44 years old and when, they, when they left, and 67% of them had at least a college degree. Irish public authorities have not only been acknowledging the situation, far from passive, they have actively supported the new trend, both through indirect stimulation and direct encouragement. At the same time, however, Dub the Dublin authorities have proved most welcoming to the tax-averse multinationals, such as Apple, Google, and Facebook. In Ireland, indeed, companies enjoy the lowest tax rate in Europe, 12.5%, austerity notwithstanding, compared to an average rate of 27% in the rest of the EU. So this is exemplary of the credit-oriented neoliberal reasoning, the efforts deployed by the Irish governments to lure big multinational corporations are thus the exact counterpart of their determination to persuade young and educated Irish people that they should leave. Of course, trading human capital for glowing brands make little business sense in the old business, in the old-fashioned way of business sense, profit. Since the companies for which these brands stand produce nothing on Ireland's soil, it's just their siege that are in Ireland. Yet from the perspective of credit worthiness, the swap where you bring Facebook and Google and send uh, young educated people who have no prospect for a job out makes perfect sense, since the assets of the emigrating youth are unlikely to be appreciated in the short run. So while Dublin authorities are still cautious about asking their young constituents to migrate, the Portuguese officials, on the other hand, have no qualms about being explicit. If you are unemployed, you have to leave your comfort zone and go beyond borders, is what the sports minister told his young compatriots in 2011. And the prime minister, Pedro Coelho, concurred, calling upon jobless teachers, for instance, to go and exercise their profession in Brazil or in Angola. Otherwise, he probably meant those countries would have been colonized in vain. And indeed, just like Ireland, very large numbers of college-educated, young college-educated Portuguese citizens have left their countries in the last six years. In 2012, the year after encouraging immigration became an official politics, about 10,000 people were leaving every month from a country with a population of 5.6 million people, half of them under 30 and highly skilled. Where Portugal differs from Ireland, though, and that's an important part, is in the nature of the swap that its political leaders seek to perform. Rather than substituting prestigious corporate brands for homegrown human capital, Coelho's team endeavors to replace educated but prospectless Portuguese youth with foreign but affluent retirees. In January 2013, Lisbon's authorities have created the status of non-habitual fiscal resident. The beneficiaries of this status are exonerated of all income tax for 10 years, provided that they buy real estate property and reside in Portugal for at least half of the year. As with the Irish swap, swap I, with, ooh, that's difficult, as with the Irish swap, it would seem that in the long run, Trading young and skilled locals for wealthy but retired foreigners is not such a profitable deal. But then again, neoliberalism is about raising the credit of a country now, about boosting its capital value per capita immediately, and not about ensuring sustained profitability. So that's the third part, population swap. The fourth way of disposing of the discredited is to curb the inflow of people who are not presumed to be very bankable. To this end, both European institutions and member states have been especially careful to keep African migrants and asylum seekers from reaching the shores of southern Europe. 
Hence, between 1989 and the end of 2014, 25,000 people at least have died trying to cross the Mediterranean. And in terms of annual death toll, 2005 is by far the worst year so far. Now, prior to 2008, the proponents of what I've called neoliberalism with a human face were already engaged in dissuasive tactics, such as blocking the access of the most convenient points of entries in Europe so as to increase the distance and the danger of the migrants' journey. But they didn't do that at the expense of disavowing their alleged attachment to the merits of attracting the talented and the hard-working foreigners to Europe. Thus, one of their preferred ways at the time, in the 90s already, of protecting their humanitarian credentials and their welcoming credentials involved outsourcing the dirty work of regulated immigration to the so-called transit countries of North Africa, especially Libya and Morocco. Indeed, Libya and Morocco in particular, but also Turkey, received ample funding either from individual states such as Italy and Spain or for the European, from the European Commission, both to upgrade their navy and police force and to build detention camps destined for aspirant migrants stemming from sub-Saharan Africa. However, once the recession hit, the language of regulation quickly gave way to that of restriction. According to its political leaders, Europe could no longer afford to be so generous. Until the winter of 2011, the change of rhetoric did, was not very consequential as the economic downturn in the North considerably reduced the flow of emigrants coming from the South. Yet when the bloody aftermath of the Arab Springs turned parts of North Africa and the Middle East into war zones, substantial cohorts of asylum seekers suddenly attempted to cross the Mediterranean and reach the Europe. Europe's shores. Determined to take as few refugees as possible, European governments were nonetheless a little reluctant to assume their inhospitality too openly, especially once they decided to intervene militarily in Libya in the name of humanitarianism. Thus, from early 2011 to the fall of 2013, the attitude towards the people fleeing the wars in Libya and later in Syria was essentially one of malign neglect. You let them drown. The neglectful, the neglectful approach to the swelling number of asylum seekers was temporarily suspended after October 2013, when a boat carrying Eritrean and Somali refugees sank near the Italian island of Lampedusa, with 360 people drowning. The magnitude of the tragedy produced enough of a shock, in Italy at least, to persuade the then Prime Minister Enrico Letta that letting asylum seeker die at such a high rate was no longer an option. He thus launched the so-called Operation Mare Nostrum, whereby the Italian Navy, police and army were mobilized, not only to patrol the Mediterranean, but also and primarily to rescue boats carrying African and Middle Eastern refugees. However, Italy's European partners refused to contribute to the operation. Their alleged motive was that the humanitarian nature of the operation actually encouraged asylum seekers and other migrants to try their luck, thereby increasing the chance of more shipwrecks but also the overinflow of asset-led foreigners. So what replaced Mare Nostrum was a fully op European operation called Triton. But whereas the Italian endeavor was primarily about rescuing people, for its part, Triton focuses primarily on what European institution calls border management. In other words, its main purpose is to patrol European territorial waters, intercept migrant boats so as to detain its passengers, send them back to the southern side of the Mediterranean, and by that token, hopefully dissuade future candidates. So, in short, obfuscating unemployment numbers, harassing to, harassing to death superfluous employees and burdensome benefit recipients, swapping underpaid college-educated youth either for glossy brands or rich retirees, and last but not least, turning a blind eye to the drowning of asylum seekers, until recently, such were the various components 
of the same neoliberal endeavor, whereby the discredited are disposed of in order to boost Europe's standing in the eyes of potential investors. So, to be sure, Europe is not the only neoliberal power that resorts to such techniques of government. Yet, what is distinctive in Europe's pursuit of creditworthiness is the fact that, like, like Japan, it has a rapidly aging population. So, indeed, most of the EU member states have a low and regularly declining birth rate, while the life expectancies of their senior population continues to increase. So that under such conditions, the European political agenda would include measures such as waging a passive-aggressive war on immigration and pushing the young and skilled to emigrate while inviting foreign retirees to take their place shows that contrary to what disenchanted Europhiles often claim, there is such a thing as a European project. And what this project involves is turning the Union into a gated community for aging yet affluent white Europeans. Now, the recent development I mentioned in the beginning of my talk raised new questions with respect to the sustainability of this gated community project. Question raised by two crises. First, the Greek crisis of the spring. The Greek crisis proved critical in two ways, regarding the neoliberal project as a whole and regarding Europe. Regarding the neoliberal project as a whole, the dictate imposed on Greek elected representatives by this unaccountable body called the Eurogroup arguably conveys that the neoliberal ambition of containing democracy, that is to say, of depriving democracy of its substance while keeping its procedures intact, has reached a limit. If, as the former uh, Greek, foreign, uh, Greek finance minister Yanis Varoukakis recounted, it is true that Wolfgang Schauble really told him that no election could change pre-existing rules, then it is arguably the case that neoliberalism can no longer accommodate democratic procedures. And that would be a big blow for the neoliberal project as a well. whole. The second change, regard, or the second question that it raised regarding Europe, is that notwithstanding Syriza's surrender, Tsipras's surrender to the demands of the Eurogroup, there is now a decisive split among, between EU officials, between two camps. On the one hand, hardliners, with Wolfgang Schauble at its helm, who profess that the Eurozone should get rid of countries where elected leaders are either reluctant or unable to play by the rules. But on the other side, you have self-proclaimed realists, like the IMF officials in particular, but also the European Central Bank officials, who advocate the use of unorthodox methods, such as quantitative easing, buying, the, um, the bonds of countries to the, in exchange for their continuation with the austerity program. But also, for the IMF, they also advocate a modicum of debt relief. In other words, if you continue with austerity, we will give you a haircut. In order to keep hesitant or in battle government on the path of structural reforms. So, in the realist camp, the head of the IMF and the ECB are willing to sponsor the austerity programs of debt-ridden debt -ridden nations. So, in order to keep Europe united under austerity, they are ready to sponsor the austerity programs of these countries. However, in all likelihood, neither quantitative, quantitative easing nor modest haircut will be equal to the task of reducing employment and poverty in this country, or even in reducing budget deficits in these countries, 
in countries like Greece, but also Portugal, Spain, Italy, or Ireland. Therefore, instead of renewing loans to insolvent states for the sake of keeping Europe united under austerity, creditors may eventually, eventually opt for the hard, line, the hard line forwarded by Wolfgang Schauble, according to whom the most fragile members of the EU, of the European families, should be invited to exit the Eurozone, if not the EU altogether. So the possibility of a fragmentation of Europe is very much there. At the same time, persistently soaring inequalities between European countries as well as within European countries, combined with the prospect of Europe's impending disintegration, may also, everything's possible, swell the ranks of anti-austerity movements on the left and on the extreme right. People motivated by the wish to reconstruct Europe and people motivated by the desire to dismantle European institutions. And thus, the swelling of these movements might pressure governing agencies into reassessing their agenda, especially when you think that China's uh, economy is not as vibrant as it was, and that in order to make it vibrant again, China is about, or has already started, to become once again an essentially export-oriented economy, making imports harder, which in turn will be a problem for the German economy, because if China does it, then the other emergent economies will do it too. And so therefore, the possibility of swapping the domestic market of Europe, which is now relatively insolvent, for the emergent markets of China and the other emerging economy will become endangered. So that will also put the whole order liberal uh, economic model of Europe in question. So that's the question raised by the Greek um, crisis. Secondly, the recent, and I'll finish with that, the recent refugee crisis also questions the possibility of preserving the status quo. It is true that until August 30th, all public officials in the EU were in agreement, including the Germans. And they had been adamant about the urgency of reinforcing the control of the Union's border in order to prevent prospective exiles from reaching the European shores. However, since Angela Merkel's apparent turnabout, immigration policies have suddenly become the source of unprecedented tensions among EU members. As far as Germany is concerned, in order to reassure her compatriots about the feasibility of her proclaimed hospitality, Angela Merkel declared on August 30th, we haven't heard that much of that since, she has declared that welcoming asylum seekers from the Middle East was not only morally justified, but also economically sound thereby disavowing the official European line about the supposedly unbearable cost of immigration. Now, in response to Ms. Merkel's uh, declaration, Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister and his partners in the so-called Visegrad group, have not only vowed to close their borders, but also called upon the rest of Europe to help them defend the continent against an impending Muslim invasion. Now, in between these two stands, equally at ease with either stands, the French and the British governments, as well as some prominent members of Ms. Merkel's governing coalition, defend an intermediary approach, whereby the EU would indeed welcome larger numbers of political refugees, but not without making Europe even more inhospitable to economic migrants. So the famous uh, reverse of what Blair said in the 90s. Though this last stance, which is also about preserving the status quo, seem to have prevailed discursively for the moment, it's been adopted even by the German government, in practice, the project of restricting the EU's generosity to certified refugees seems highly unrealistic. 
just if you read about the inflow of people coming to Germany every day from Montenegro, from Kosovo, from Serbia, and from Croatia, but that's part of Europe, uh, the idea of stopping that flow violently would be extremely brutal. So European authorities cannot seriously endeavor to separate the good asylum seekers from the bad economic migrants so as to repel and deport the latter without committing massive human rights violations, both on European soil and in the so-called transit countries where the EU finances the equipment of border patrols and the construction of detention centers. I've recently read that the Turkish government, for one, said that it would be ready to help the Europeans uh, contain uh, the migrant inflow, but what it would ask uh, in exchange would be that the EU would give them, would give Turkey a no-fly zone uh, over Kurdish territory. So, if you start to make these kind of deals, uh, the violence that would ensue would be unprecedented. Therefore, far from providing a humane alternative to the militant xenophobia championed, for instance, by the Hungarian Prime Minister, if Europe is serious about the dual treatment of foreigners according to the nature of their motives for seeking Europe's hospitality, well, if they do that, they are bound to, in fact, vindicate Viktor Orban's vision of Europe. At the same time, the steady flow of people coming from the Middle East, but also from Africa and the Balkans, not to mention the internal migration from the impoverished countries of, towards the more affluent regions of the EU, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Greeks, who come to Germany in particular, all that may convince European officials that given the ever-growing human, economic and symbolic costs of turning the territory under their jurisdiction into a fortress, it is no longer in their interest to present immigration as a problem they intend to solve instead of as an opportunity they intend to seize. In other words, the paradigm shift that was fleetingly evoked by Angela Merkel on August 30th, when she said that Germany could afford to be hospitable, could impose itself as the only alternative to the gra gradual brutalization of Europe. In sum, it could be that unless the European project of turning Europe into a gated community is abandoned altogether, unless they abandon it, the status quo is no longer possible. So if the project is not abandoned, well then indeed we might be precipitated towards the next war.